Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolff. A quick word, as usual, about Charlie Fabian, who stands ready to receive suggestions, items of interest that you think might help us plan future segments on this program. You can reach him at charlie.info438 at gmail.com. That's charlie.info438 at gmail.com. I want today to talk about a number of things. The Apple computer case being brought by the Department of the Treasury here in the United States. Uh, The Georgia legislature siding with employers against employees in a new way. The fact that in two of our states, independent working class individuals have decided to run for high office and who they are and why they're doing it. And finally, the admission by the Federal Reserve that the inflation is not coming down the way they had hoped and planned and that interest rates will therefore stay high rather than come down as they had said they would. In the second half of the show, we will have an interview about the very important United Auto Workers election that is now going to take place in Chattanooga, Tennessee, at the VW factory there, which marks a major turning point, or could at least, uh, in the labor movement here in the United States. And we'll have our guest, Mike Elk, a specialist in these topics, with us at that time. Okay, let's go. Apple Computer was charged by the U.S. Department of the Treasury with functioning like a monopoly, trying to make sure it's the only one selling a variety of services and therefore charging more than they otherwise could if they didn't block the competition of competitors. I want to talk about this, not so much about the particulars of this case, but more about the phenomena itself, so there's no misunderstanding. Virtually all capitalists dream of becoming monopolists, and the reason for that is very simple. If you're a capitalist, among others, you're a competitor, You are limited in the price you can charge by the fact that your competitors, producing more or less the same thing you do, if they don't raise their price and you do, your customers will go to them and you'll lose those customers. And that operates as a kind of discipline. You don't raise your price. But if you can shut competitors out, if you have none, well, then you don't suffer that problem. You can raise your price. Your customers may not buy, but they got no alternative. So many of them you expect and you find will in fact grin and bear it or not grin, grit their teeth and pay the higher price. In short, a monopolist can raise prices higher than competitors normally can and thereby realize a bigger profit. And since profit is what the business is there to achieve, monopoly becomes an objective simply out of the logic of a profit-driven capitalism. Defenders of capitalism often try the following argument. If this happens, if company A, Apple, or anybody else gets a monopoly, and raises profits by raising its prices, well, that will become an incentive for other capitalists to want to get in on this business because look how much money the monopolist is making. The problem with this argument is that the people who have been most interested in it are the monopolists who understand exactly what threatens their monopoly is the arrival, the entry of others into that business. So they create barriers to entry. There's a whole literature in economics devoted to how and why and when monopolists erect barriers to entry. I'll give you a couple of examples. 
you do a heavy advertising for your project, for your product, you know, like, say, Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Millions of people make soda pop, but we buy those because we're constantly barraged, and no new entry can come in really easily and compete because they would have to have an advertising budget that they can't afford. That's a way of doing that. Claiming that your, your product has some magic ingredient that nobody else has is another way of trying to do that. In other words, monopolists know how to last for a long time. Then there's another argument that says, well, yeah, but the Department of Justice Antitrust Division will find them out and prosecute them. Well, you know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But here's what we know and what we see. Monopolists tend to last a long time. A very small number of companies, technically called an oligopoly, if it's more than one, are very common in the United States, and they have been in the past, and here we are with Apple doing it again. Monopolies rip us off. They get more out of us than a competitive economic system would allow, and they do it all the time, and they do it for years before eventually they are faced with a new entry or an antitrust action. Monopoly and its costs are a regular part of modern capitalism, and we are its victims. The Georgia legislature passed a bill signed by Governor Kemp that is remarkable. It says the state will no longer give subsidies to any company that agrees to recognize a union without having a union election. Now, let's be clear. Do governments like Georgia's give subsidies? You bet. The biggest subsidies recently given by Georgia, one was to the Hyundai Corporation, a Korean auto manufacturer, over $1 billion of Georgia people's taxes. And the other one, the Rivian Electric Truck Company, also got over a billion dollars. So they're giving away the people's money, but they're not allowing what the national law calls for. The National Labor Relations Act of 1935, uh, sorry, of 1935 says that there are two ways you can get a union out of workplace. You can get 30% or more of the workers there to sign a card, I want to have the right to join a union. And then you can go to the management and you can say, we've got these 30% of the workers or more. And you have to do one of two things, either recognize the union because you see how many people want it, or you have an election and let the workers vote yes or no to have that union. That choice is up to the workers and the employer to make. In comes the governor of Georgia to show how much that government is on the side of employers. We will not let you recognize a union. You will not be allowed to. You'll suffer no subsidies from us if you do that. You have to force the workers to go through the procedure of a union. Now, I'm struck by this. I'm struck by no longer hiding that the government is on the side of the employers. It's not exactly hot news. On the other hand, it's usually hidden behind the pretense of being the government for everybody. Yeah, sure. But here it's right out in the open. We're telling employers that we won't accept the easier way for the union. We'll punish you if you go there. Wow. But it's also stupid. And here's why it's stupid. Many times the employer doesn't want to spend the money and the time and aggravate his own employees by the pressure to get them to vote against the union. It's easier, it's cheaper, it's quicker. Recognize the union. Plenty of companies have done that. This freedom of the employer to make that decision has been removed because you're going to punish that employer by denying them a subsidy. But it's stupid in another way. 
it's like a, a lesson. We may now see governors in other states that are union states pulling the same stunt in the other way. You will not get a subsidy, such other governors can say, unless you recognize the union without an election. It would be the perfect response to what they've done in Georgia. I want to call out two independent working class candidates who have stepped forward to run for higher office on a program of helping working people, and they seem to really mean it. One is Dan Osborne in Nebraska, and the other one is Zach Shrewsbury in West Virginia. How interesting that those two states, Nebraska and West Virginia, would be the place where ex-soldiers who have been advocates for unions and labor rights and the rights and needs of working people should now be running for high office. There is a change in the wind. It's happening across the labor field with unions and strikes, and it's now entering the political arena too. Yes, we have the independent candidacies of Jill Stein and Cornell West, but we also have the independent working class emerging in places like Nebraska and West Virginia. These are important presences in an election that would otherwise be between the two old white men of whom most Americans are very tired. Finally, for today, it's extraordinary that I have to say this, but I will. The Federal Reserve has now announced that interest rates will not come down anywhere near as soon or as fast as they had hoped because inflation is not being brought down as soon and as fast as they had hoped. Wow. The nerve. The Federal Reserve told us that it, we wouldn't have an inflation four years ago. They were wrong. They told us it wouldn't go very high. They were wrong. They told us that they would have to raise interest rates as the only procedure to slow the inflation. Turns out they were wrong about that. And not just wrong that the inflation didn't behave the way they told us to. By now, we're used to them being wrong about that. But I need to explain again that raising interest rates never was and is not now the only or the necessary way to try to cope with an inflation. And it's especially relevant now that you haven't coped real well, have you, Federal Reserve? And reminders, what have we explained? There's wage price controls and freezes the sort that President Nixon did way back in 1971, the sort that Franklin Roosevelt, another president, did back in the 1940s with rationing as a way to prevent prices from going up and hurting the mass of the American people. This is a government that never debated, never discussed, never presented to the people our own history as having done these other ways of dealing with inflation. And it's particularly poignant now that their way isn't working real well. And the problem that we shouldn't have had, they told us, and we have, and they haven't mastered, is a screaming reminder of what they refuse to do. We've come to the end of today's first half. Please stay with us. We'll be right back with an interview of Mike Elk about the upcoming union election, United Auto Workers, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Welcome back, friends, to the second half of today's economic update. I am very proud to bring back to our microphones and our cameras, Mike Elk. He's been on the program before, but now we have something of special significance to talk with him about. 
Mike is an Emmy-nominated labor reporter and filmmaker. After covering the South for The Guardian, he founded Payday Report in 2016 after being illegally fired for union organizing at Politico. Known for on-the-road reporting of labor events, he splits his time between Pittsburgh, his hometown, and Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. I want to mention that I get a lot, and many of our supporters do, by reading Payday Report. It's a way to keep abreast of strike and union activity across the United States that has really no, no equal and is really well worth the effort, uh, and I recommend it to you. All right, let's start, Mike, uh, with a big question. Tell me, what is the significance in your mind of the uh, calling of a National Labor Relations Board supervised election for the workers at the Chattanooga, Tennessee Volkswagen uh, factory uh, done by the UAW? Well, I, th I think the significance of, you know, this election in Chattanooga is astronomical. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, the UAW ran a union election in Chattanooga at Volkswagen, hoping to win. Uh, they were hoping to win in part because it was a German company. Uh, and they thought that maybe a German company would be more progressive minded with unions, but they weren't. And the union narrowly lost by about 80 votes the first time around. And so, you know, it was a huge upset. You know, everybody was so excited 10 years ago that if we win in Chattanooga, it's going to open the door to unionizing the South. Uh, five years later, they tried again. They lost by about 40 votes this time uh, in Chattanooga. And, you know, it, Chattanooga unionizing at Volkswagen has been one of these bars that the labor movement for 10 years has been trying and trying and trying and trying and putting a lot of effort into reach. Now, from what I can tell, and I covered the last two on the ground, things are very, very different in Chattanooga. I just came out with an article called After the Pandemic and the Big Stand-Up Strikes, Everything Changed. Uh, and everything has changed in Chattanooga. Um, you know, previously, when they ran these campaigns um, at the factory there, there would be TV ads on the local TV saying, look, you know, do you want to bring in the UAW? It has all these corruption issues. Look at Detroit. Detroit's not looking so good. And this was after the big auto bailout. So, you know, if you're in a small town like Chattanooga, which is 100,000 people, and they're telling you your town might be bombed out like Detroit. I mean, I love Detroit. No offense to Detroit. But, you know, they played on the worst stereotypes of Detroit to try to scare people. Uh, and it worked. And so now uh, that plant recently expanded. And Dave Dane over the American Prospect has a great article. Uh, because they just added an electric vehicle line. And it's very unlikely, given the tax incentives from the Biden administration and the current policy, that they're going to close that plant anytime soon. So the fear of that plant closing is no longer on the table, which motivated a lot of workers against it. On top of that, you know, the president of the UAW during the last union election went to jail. All the top leadership of the UAW went to jail. They were accepting bribes from Chrysler. They were doing all kind of really dirty stuff. So what happened is the federal government came in, they implemented a rule in the UAW, which said that every member of the UAW has a right to vote for president. So you had the first open election in UAW history. Uh, since Walter Ruther founded the UAW, it's always been ruled by what's called the administration caucus. So you have uh, this guy get elected, Sean Fain, as a reformer. And Fain leads the union through the stand-up strike, the first time the UAW struck all big three employers at the same time. And the contract that they won has become so popular that just to try to keep up, Volkswagen had to raise wages by 11%. So now, well, do we want to be like the guys getting the big pay raises and, and you know, the union's clean and they're not going to close the factory? The conversation has shifted dramatically there. And the other thing that I think has really shifted the conversation is what happened to us as a nation during the pandemic, right? We saw a massive strike wave. Payday tracked over 3,000 strikes since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and what happened is I think workers have a new sense of themselves. They were called essential during the pandemic. And I think a lot of workers believe that, that they are essential. And they're not going to be treated the same way anymore. And so you're seeing that. And I think the other thing you're seeing is, is you're seeing a lot of young people at that plant 
uh, get involved in a major way. Um, you know, we've had Amazon, you've had the big Starbucks drive. Starbucks just announced that they would bargain with the over 400 stores of theirs that have unionized. So you have positive examples out there. And I think the other thing that's happening that's quite interesting is, look, the last two times they tried to unionize at Chattanooga and Volkswagen, um, they, you know, tried it with, we're just going to focus on Chattanooga. Now the UAW has a national push. Uh, they're very close to a union election at Mercedes in Vance, Alabama. That's outside of Tuscaloosa, big college town. Uh, they are, they've announced a public campaign at Hyundai in Montgomery, and they have a public campaign at a Toyota shop in Missouri. So now you have these, the workers that are on the committee, because look, I've been through Chattanooga union elections. They're rough. I mean, they're going to pound them on TV like they always do. But now the plant just expanded. The union's clean. And people have a different sense of themselves after the pandemic. So in my view, this is looking like a very optimistic scenario. I, I could be wrong, but it is the most optimistic I felt in the three union elections that I've covered there. Let me ask you a small question, but one that I know many of my viewers and listeners are concerned about. I reported recently about the Georgia legislature intervening directly in whether or not a company would go with a recognition of a union with or without an election. I mean, it's the most blatant direct involvement of the state government on the side of the employer that I've seen, withholding subsidies unless you do what the politicals want you to do. It violates the NLRB uh, law anyway. But are you worried or not? Or are the folks in Chattanooga worried that the authorities there will be some kind of significant player in shaping public opinion? Well, they're trying to. Uh, previously, you know, in 2014, the state actually threatened to take tax incentives away from Volkswagen unless they fought the union. As a European company, as a German company, they didn't run a traditional anti-union campaign. It was much more passive aggressive, uh, so to say. It wasn't the big, bold, you know, let's hold big captive audience meetings. So in 2014, uh, they did threaten to take away tax incentives to the state. The governor of Tennessee right now is, is blasting the union, telling workers not to bring it in. And part of the reason the community is responding is, look, this is a town of 100,000 people, a little more than that, Chattanooga. This is a factory of about 4,000 people. If the biggest factory in the town goes union, that sets a precedent for everything else in the town. So what we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing right now at Mercedes, which is just a few hours down the road, is that um, the local employers are spending money to campaign against the union because Mercedes isn't doing an aggressive enough job. So you're seeing a lot of concern from the local employers that if we get one big union in at any of these plants, then the smaller factories in town are going to go union as well. Yeah, I find it interesting because in Germany, they have this concept. In German, it's called Mitbestimmung, and it means co-determination. All unions of, of plants of 2,000 workers or more, automatically the workers get the right to elect worker representatives on the board of directors. And that's been the case in Germany throughout its extraordinary history as the most successful economy in Europe. So the European employers are not anti-union in the way that they are here. That battle was fought. The employers lost it. And it's now the settled activity there. Okay. So one of my questions was you have answered. Um, Will this have an impact, especially if there's a victory on organizing and on the whole political and labor complexion of the South? Well, look, the toughest part about organizing is believing you can win. And when you see someone win, that tells folks elsewhere that they can win. Look, UAW is very close to a union election at Mercedes in Alabama. A Hyundai is right down the road in Montgomery. They have a public campaign there and they have a public campaign at Toyota, and they're trying elsewhere. I think they're trying at something like 15 different employers in the South. So if they win at one place, then the organizers in those other factories are going to think we can do it too, and it's going to motivate, um, and it's going to push. 
And, you know, the UAW has never tried this kind of national strike strategy. And it's important to note that the UAW has decided to spend $40 million over the next two years organizing. So, you know, they just won that big strike that got a lot of positive publicity and they're going for broke right now. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to go the whole way. Uh, they're, they're, they're putting all their cards on the table and it's an ambitious, bold move. And, and let's see where it goes. What is the relevance, if any, of the uh, national election? And by that, I mean, does the Trump phenomena or the Biden-Trump race or for that matter, Bernie Sanders as a political actor, or even Jill Stein and Cornell West, are, are any, is any of that affecting this race in one way or another? Well, President Biden has spoken out on behalf of Volkswagen workers in Chattanooga. Uh, that is, the city itself is Democratic, but Tennessee is very, very Republican. And part of the reason he's doing that isn't just so that workers in Tennessee see that he's speaking out on behalf of the union. It's so that workers in the Midwest see that he's talking on behalf of the union. Um, you know, Biden is dealing with very big unpopularity issues right now because of Gaza. Uh, rightfully so. Uh, you know, it's been a disaster, a uh, horrific humanitarian crisis. and We need to stop the shooting. And Prior to that, he was kind of popular with union folks. I mean, Biden walked the picket line for the UAW during the stand-up strike. He's spoken out on behalf of workers several times. And I think Biden sees that it's important for him to give a statement so that workers, just not in Tennessee, but in other parts of the country, see that he's standing up and fighting for them. What can anybody listening to you, watching, is there anything that they can do that you might think of to be supportive in the in all of this effort in the South? Well, they can certainly uh, donate to us at paydayreport.com so that we can keep covering it. And I think the most important thing they can do is talk to their friends and neighbors and, and talk about what's happening. Because look, union is a culture, right? I grew up in a very big union culture. I grew up in uh, Pittsburgh uh, in a UE family, and a lot of the folks around us had worked in the big UE factories nearby at Westinghouse and Switch and Signal. The most important thing people can do is talk to their neighbors and keep the momentum and the culture of this moving. Would you say the following is true? And this is the last question we'll have time for. Some folks have argued that the wave of militancy, which we have seen from college campuses to Starbucks and Amazon and all of that, is somehow not paralleled by industrial militants. It would seem that that's being put to rest as an idea by this kind of a campaign on the part of the UAW. Would you agree or do well, you have a different thought? Well, let, let me say this. I, I think the, the media focuses too much on the Starbucks workers and the graduate students. And I've written about this extensively right now. If you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers for the past two years, the main reason the labor movement is growing right now is because of black workers in the South, in the public sector. Uh, actually, 100% of union growth is due to workers of color. Uh, white workers are actually losing uh, union membership. And I think the media tends to fixate on the Starbucks workers because they're from the same part of the caste system. They're white, college-educated people. So it's a story the media likes to focus on. So I, I would really reject that frame. There's been quite a bit of organizing. I think the problem has been that the media is so white. It's so based in New York. Sorry, I know you live in New York. Uh, and it's so out of touch with the country. I mean, even the left wing reporters I meet from New York. I mean, you fly those people to Chicago. They feel like they're going on like a, a grand tour, uh, you know. If you get out in this country, the real action has been in the industrial sector. I think Starbucks, since it's white college educated workers and it's a big name brand, people like to focus on. But that's only 4,000 workers. Winning this plant will be more workers than in the entire Starbucks campaigns. So I think there's been quite a bit of militancy already. I'm really glad you brought that up and made these points. That's why I asked the question. Thank you very much, Mike. We've come to the end, but we'll have you back on the program again. And let me remind everyone, Payday Report is well worth the effort. You'll learn a great deal. 
of the kinds of insights that Mike has offered. Thank you again, Mike. And to my audience, as usual, I look forward to speaking with you again next week.